I'm a professor and climate extension specialist at the University of Maryland. And Stephanie gave you a bit of my background. Um, I spent uh, 35 years doing research on ecology and genetics, but I'm broadly trained as a biologist. And when I turned to uh, climate extension from my research career, I got really interested in soil health because of the implications that it has for increasing resilience to climate change in agriculture and also its implications as a climate solution. So that's what I'll be talking to you about today. Okay, you might wonder if you're a farmer or an NRCS person or maybe somebody who doesn't think about climate change all the time, you might wonder why do I need to worry about climate change? Well, uh, it turns out that even though uh, the warming that we are experiencing seems is so gradual that we can't detect it year by year. When we look at the long-term data, what we see is that, you know, here's the pre-industrial average before um, the impacts of the industrial revolution really became clear. And then what you can see is we, we basically have had sort of a gradual increase. It was a little plateau here for a while due to other reasons we know about. But since about 1970, we've just been seeing an acceleration of both the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and also the global average temperature. Um, the last five years have been very hot. And in fact, 19 of the 20 hottest years on record, that is since global temperature records were first uh, started to be taken, um, uh, uh, 19 of the 20 hottest years have been since the year 20, since the year 2000. So there have only been you know, 20 full years since the year 2000. So this means we're really into new territory, okay? This increase in global temperature could not have occurred by chance. We know that it is being driven um, by human activities. Um, the uh, increase in temperature, um, although it might seem small, okay, just a, a degree or so centigrade so far, um, is really having an impact on the summers. and. Um, and how, what the summer experience is like. Um, across the U.S., the average change in temperature has been 1.2 degrees C, which is um, uh, three point something, sorry, I forgot uh, uh, to include this, 3.5 or something degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and again, that's the average. So temperature fluctuations occur around this average. Um, some areas are, are warming up a lot faster, not surprisingly some of these urban areas, um, but because of the increase in average temperature, we're seeing many, many more super hot days. Longer heat waves, they're more common and they're more extreme. Um, for human health, this is a big problem because uh, the heat is experienced as essentially hotter because of the increased humidity in the air. But for agriculture, the um, increase in heat waves and the increase in summer temperatures, um, obviously in particular, is a real problem because it causes the soil to dry out faster. And then this can toss plants, uh, crop plants into um, moisture stress, even when, you know, before they might not have been um, uh, stressed for moisture with the same amount of average rainfall. Uh, the next thing that we're seeing from climate change is much more frequent and severe flooding. And this is both inland and tidal, um, but the inland flooding is, is probably most of interest to all of you. Um, this is because we are experiencing more rain throughout the year, not during the summer in the, uh, in the mid-Atlantic, but about five more inches over, across the year um, in Maryland. And um, it's not just that there's more rain, but that the rain is falling more like downpours, as downpours, as super heavy rain events where we're getting multiple inches of rain in one day. Um, and this is a big problem. Here's a picture from, oh, sorry, there's a stray date there in the middle. A picture from Maryland in 2018 when we had 10 inches of rain in one week um, during a critical period of corn planting. Um, I've got my wrong mouse here, so I, I'm sorry, I can't wiggle the mouse or it'll advance, apologies. Um, we had 10 inches of rain in the eastern shore, this was a huge problem. 
Um, in the Midwest in 2019, uh, there were gigantic floods. And this picture, which appeared in a, a newspaper out there, really caught my eye because it reveals um, a huge problem in sort of management, soil management in the Midwest, which is the typical thing is to um, till in the fall, okay, and then leave the fields bare, fallow across over the winter. This just opens up the picture for se uh, severe erosion. And um, of course, the tillage is not helping either, but it was as I understand from various news reports, et cetera, from that region, it was very eye-opening to many Midwest farmers to see that fields where there were cover crops did not necessarily have these prolonged um, pooling uh, um, situation as this particular field had. Anyway, more um, heavy rain, more flooding. Um, and um, as Stephanie uh, um, mentioned just briefly a few minutes ago, many of the techniques of modern agriculture uh, continue to damage the soil. In particular, tillage, you know, shown here, um, I'll have a lot more to say about that later. Um, very, very heavy equipment, um, uh, especially used on fields that are not completely dry. Um, we are finding a lot more wind and water erosion. So this is a recent picture from Kansas where the wind has really whipped up a lot of dust. Here's water erosion. And when um, the soil is eroded, you get a crust on the top like this, which is not very congenial for the seedlings as you can see here. Um, so tillage and leaving soil bare increases the vulnerability of agricultural fields to flooding and drought, both of them, both flooding and drought. And this increases the financial risk to farmers from climate change. So how can we turn this around? We can use the NRCS practices that boost soil health. And that's what I'll be telling you about. Um, you've learned a lot about soil invertebrates, and I love soil invertebrates. Um, I'm an insect person myself, but um, I also used to work on aquatic invertebrates. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit more about other critters in the soil, the secret life of soil, um, and that concerns the microbes. Just one small teaspoon of soil contains over a billion microbes, that is bacteria and fungi. Um, and um, these microbes are crucial to the health of plants and to the health of the soil. Um, they're so important to the plants that plants give up to 40% of the sugar that they make during photosynthesis to the soil bacteria and fungi by pumping that sugar down into the roots and that leaks out or various, um, you'll see later how, how other organisms access that sugar. The plants get something for this, okay? They're not just dumping the sugar into the soil for fun. Um, they get nitrogen, phosphorus, water, other nutrients. They get protection from diseases, from predators and abiotic stress. All of these are provided by those microbes. So there's a very tight symbiotic relationship between um, plant roots, including of course crop plants and soil microbial life. The main groups of soil microbes um, that we'll be you know, thinking about uh, today are nitrogen fixing bacteria, uh, which pull nitrogen out of the air and turn it into essentially fertilizer, mycorrhizal fungi, and then a whole squad, hundreds of species of other bacteria um, that do various things for plants um, in the soil. This is a picture, it's a little bit hazy here, but this dark reddish in the uh, center is a plant root, and the green it, um, are bacterial cells of a soil bacterium that have been stained to glow green under fluorescent light. And you can see that they are glommed on to the plant root in a very thick layer. And this actually provides a physical shield against the invasion of pathogenic bacteria. So um, there's just all kinds of cool things going on in the soil. To turn to nitrogen fixing bacteria, as I said, some very special bacteria can take nitrogen, which is just two nitrogen atoms together, from the air. No living thing can use N2, uh, elemental nitrogen. Um, and these bacteria make ammonia at NH3 from that. And that is a source of nitrogen that can be taken up by plants. Um, there are some free living 
nitrogen fixing bacteria, but the most common ones, um, especially for crop plants, are um, those that are found in nodules on the roots. And so here's a section, a long section through a root, which shows the nodules. And inside those nodules, uh, they are just crammed full of these nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, uh, here's a picture of um, a pea plant I pulled up from my garden this summer. Um, and it's always gratifying just to make sure there's nodules on there. But again, here's the nodules, not as regular as that, but they're full of bacteria. Now, as you all know, gardeners and farmers alike, you can inoculate fields with, um, I apologize for that. You can inoculate fields with um, powdered um, uh, bacterial uh, um, uh, material that will help the plants um, recruit these bacteria into the roots. Um, it's really interesting that the first nitrogen fixing bacteria evolved in the ocean about 2 billion years ago. Um, and this was an important part of sort of the whole uh, photosynthesis appeared about 2.2 billion years ago, and then oxygen um, took over the atmosphere. So it's it's kind of interesting. Um, these end-fixing bacteria have been around a long time. Uh, the main group of fungi I want to talk to you about um, is a classification. Not a this is not a uh, taxonomic classification, but Michael Rizzi, uh, describe the whole group of fungal species that colonize plant roots. And this is a classic picture of mycorrhizae. Here's a little tiny conifer seedling. And the orangish that you can see down here um, is the root of that, of that little seedling. All the rest of this stuff, which you might think is roots, Nope, not roots. Those are fungal hyphae that are going out into the soil way away from the plant roots to gather up um, water and nutrients. Um, so these mycorrhizal fungi are really instrumental in, uh, in flowering plants and helping them take up water and nutrients. Um, and uh, well, also gymnosperms, uh, pines and conifers. And these things evolved about the same time as land plants. And they are thought to have assisted the evolution of plants on land by helping them acquire water and nutrients. Mycorrhizae also do a lot of other stuff like fighting disease. They combat plant stress, not just water and nutrient stress. Mycorrhizae can even act as predators. Who knew a fungus could actually capture a predatory, um, a plant predatory earth um, nematode. And um, the hyphae of mycorrhizae, these filaments that come out, this is the main body of the fungus, go underground for long distances and they can connect many different plants underground. They can even link plants of different species and take sugar from one, give it to another. There's a lot going on under there. Mycorrhizae require living roots. So first I wanna say one thing, Mycorrhizae are the main kinds of fungi that are really out there helping plants, and they require living roots. Um, although you might hear people say that you can inoculate your soil with mycorrhizae using compost, that is not the case because these fungi are not in compost. They require living roots. They can't stand the high temperature of compost. So, you know, there, there it is. You can't get them out of compost. Um, up to 90% of all plant land plants have mycorrhizae and they increase that root area hundreds of times. Okay, as I said, provide access to water and nutrients. Um, if you just, if the plants were just relying on their, uh, on their little roots, their little root hairs like this. Um, I'm sorry, I should have swapped in my other mouse, which I forgot. Um, if they relied just on the roots, you can see from this cartoon that the uh, region of the soil where the root can suck up phosphorus is very thin. But when it hooks up with mycorrhizal fungi, then that extends this you know, region over which they can get water, you know, as I said, 700 times. So they're very, very, very important to plants. Um, other fungi are single cells, mycorrhizae are multicellular, of course. Other fungi that are single celled can live right in the roots or in the, in the leaves. 
the, the mycorrhizal fungi have part of the hyphae in the roots, but the rest is outside. Um, and these endosymbiotic fungi uh, can really do some super things. In particular, there are some root endosymbiotic fungi that can increase salt tolerance, increase heat tolerance, increase drought tolerance. Um, these things can fight disease, they can repel insect pests. They're, you know, they're pretty powerful in the life of plants. So um, in addition to all the cool uh, multicellular invertebrates you learned about, there's a lot of action going on um, with the microbes in the soil. So um, if we build healthy soil, these microbes and these invertebrates will come, right? And the farmers can, um, um, and gardeners, of course, can make use of these naturally occurring bacteria and fungi that help plants out. They promote plant growth, they fight pathogens, they moderate stress, and you get all that for free if you have healthy soil. If you have degraded agricultural soil, well, okay, then you need to put on more synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, you need to put on more pesticides, you need more fungicides, you need more irrigation. So it's very beneficial, not just to the plants, but to the farmers to be able to recruit these natural allies of plants that allow um, far fewer inputs to be used on, on soil. Okay. Um, Let's talk about the physical structure of healthy soil for just a second. Um, when we look at soil, if we have a pie chart of what's in soil, you can see that just about 50% of soil is made out of water and air. And you know, you don't think about that when you're walking around outside on it. It all seems perfectly uh, stable. But this mixture of water and air and the spaces that occur in the soil where water and air are found, as you can see in this picture. Um, so here's water, the gray is air. So there are all kinds of multicellular things that, uh, of the types you learned about wandering around in the air spaces. And there are also big water spaces and these are essential. This does not occur automatically. It does not sort of self-assemble. The structure is built by the organisms in the soil and it's very, very intricate and super important to the functioning of soil. Um, as you all know, healthy soil is crumbly. And part of the reason that it's crumbly is it's made up of these sort of aggregates, which are uh, um, so groups of teeny soil particles. Um, these aggregates, here's a picture of a, um, a part of an aggregate where there's a, a root, there's a bunch of fun, uh, fungal hyphae, here's some fungal spores. Um, there's little organisms crawling around in between the soil particles. Um, and there can be tiny, tiny, tiny bits of um, organic material, very uh, decom highly decomposed organic material stuck in tiny spaces. Um, so uh, this specific structure is formed by the living things in the soil. Um, there, the aggregates are held together by roots and their exudates, that means the sugary sticky stuff that comes out of the roots, um, by mycorrhizae and again, another sort of sugary sticky stuff that comes out of the mycorrhizae. Um, these exudates and the mycorrhizal glue hold these aggregates together even after the fungal hyphae or the, um, the roots are dead. So you don't need to have those living roots to hold this together. Um, and there's some other sticky material from other soil organisms that, that kicks in. But the key thing about these materials that are holding these little particles of soil together is that they're stable in water, okay? And so the aggregate has this structure where there's a bunch of little tiny soil particles, there are pores, large pores, there's intermediate pores, and there's small pores in there. And this pore structure is stable in water because the glue does not um, dis dissolve in water, okay? So um, the structure is maintained and it forms crucial habitat for all of the soil food web, including of course the microbes. Um, healthy soil with good aggregate structure like this increases climate resilience in agriculture in two ways. First, the structure of the aggregates reduce risk from flooding. And they do that because water can infiltrate 
into, uh, into the soil, okay, and go down through these pores through the soil and sort of continue on down um, to deeper depth through other pores in, you know, lower down. And this increases water infiltration. Without this stable pore system, the water just lays on the top. And um, I don't, you know, this is a picture from Maryland. I don't know whether this farmer did no-till or not. If there's enough rain, of course, there's going to be flooding. But um, uh, if, as in the case of that picture I showed you of the Midwest, where you have tillage and then flooding, there's not very much infiltration and that water hangs around a long time. Um, with good, good structure, you get good drainage of stormwater. Healthy soil also increases climate resilience by reducing the risk of drought, okay? So the same structure both allows water to drain through these large pores and holds little bits of water, it's just my cartoon, in these small pores, okay? So it holds this water and plants can access that during periods of drought. So um, the ability to buffer farmers from risks, from in increasing risks, these are pretty much increasing every year now, increasing risks from flood and drought um, uh, essentially makes healthy soil what scientists call the top no regrets strategy for climate resilience. No regrets means even if you don't think climate change is happening, improving soil health is going to benefit you in many, many ways. But it also will really benefit and buffer farmers from the, um, the problems caused by flooding and drought. Okay, um, I know you all have seen slake tests before, but I just want to show you the difference um, uh, in soil and how it reacts to water when it's healthy and unhealthy. Um, I collected these soil samples myself from a 40 year old meadow that's right across the street from my house and also from a nearby overgrazed and super eroded piece of ground, which um, although this was not tilled, this is what tilled soil winds up looking like. Um, uh, and these pictures from um, a book, a Sayre book, uh, show that when you've got healthy soil, as you do in this meadow where there's just deep roots and, you know, uh, very little disturbance, um, water just can infiltrate through the pores. Here, no deal because you get a crust on the top and the water just runs off along with more of the important organic material, et cetera, in the soil. So the slake test, I had, I had a chunk of soil from the meadow and another chunk of soil from this, um, eroded area and you put those in water and immediately the poor soil starts to fall apart. Okay, soil scientists call that slaking. That's why this is called the slake test. Um, but you can leave the good soil in this column of water, just sitting there in the water for hours. And a few little crumbs might fall off the surface, but it basically remains intact. This turns into just sludge. <laughs> so that's, um, uh, that's a documentation of the fact that these aggregates are stable in water. And this reduces erosion and the loss of organic matter, helps control stormwater, and stores water for dry time. So healthy soil is very, very useful. Um, I want to turn now to just discuss uh, for the rest of the time how soil, healthy soil, can make agriculture part of the climate solution. So healthy soil does something for farmers by reducing their risk, but it also does something for the rest of society by um, essentially providing a very uh, uh, available and cost-effective way to store carbon in the soil. It turns out that land-based carbon sequestration, that means in forests and farms, um, is available now and it is in fact the most cost-effective way to take carbon that was in the atmosphere and store it in, in the soil, in forests and farms. Um, plants take the carbon out of the atmosphere, okay? They reduce atmospheric carbon dioxide, and as I said, turn it into sugars. Um, and uh, there are other ways that we can reduce atmospheric carbon dioxide. Of course, we can stop emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, but uh, 
carbon dioxide can be sucked out of the atmosphere, but many of these methods are not really ready for prime time. Soil carbon sequestration is ready right now. And it can be, uh, carbon can be sequestered in soil and woody plants using many of the NRCS uh, conservation practices that are now used mostly to increase water quality. It turns out as, the, as we have used these to increase water quality, we have also sequestered carbon. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. So what are these practices that sequester carbon? How much greenhouse gas reduction from the atmosphere is, is possible using these practices? And how can we encourage farmers to use the practices more? One piece of really good news is that reducing atmospheric carbon uh, dioxide is becoming so urgent that um, it's because it is uh, now worth it to um, pay farmers to utilize these practices uh, for the social good, okay? And um, there's a lot of motivation now um, uh, growing at the federal level. I think we're going to see some action on this, um, but also among private um, non-governmental organizations to fund land-based carbon sequestration as a climate solution. So I'll tell you more about that. Whoops, okay. Um, carbon sequestration in agricultural soil. As I said, plants absorb atmospheric carbon dioxide during photosynthesis and with hydrogen, they turn that into sugar, okay? Carbon dioxide, CO2, hydrogen, H2, turns into sugar with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. In healthy soil, as I said before, up to 40% of this carbon gets passed down through the roots to soil microbes and they slurp up the sugar. Most of the carbon that is stored, well, let me back up one second. Most of the plant generated material in fields or in your garden is, does not wind up getting stored, okay? A very small amount of the biomass that is generated from photosynthesis winds up being stored. Um, and it has taken scientists quite a while to actually figure out how much is stored and where it comes from. It turns out that most of the carbon that winds up being stored comes from the roots, okay? And it has been, quote, processed by microbes. That means basically slurped up and turned into microbial biomass. Um, a little bit of stored carbon comes from highly degraded organic matter, but much of it is in fact little bits of microbes and cell walls and stuff like that. And I'll show you that in a picture in just a minute. Um, here's a um, figure from a paper. Um... Sarah? Yes. All right, this is Stephanie. I'm just gonna jump in here because there's a question in the, the chat just asking about um, clarification between labile carbon, if that's the carbon that you're talking about driving the, the engine. Labile means it, you, it um, is short-lived, okay? Uh, labile carbon is like corn stalks and um, organic material like you put in compost. You can add compost. That material is degraded by, um, by uh, the soil invertebrates and also the microbes and turned into microbes. And from that material, um, nutrients are released that plants suck up but most of that is not stored, okay? Stored means put into a place for a long time where it is protected from microbial decomposition. So I'll tell you more about that in just a minute, but hopefully that will answer the question. Um, okay, uh, so sorry, this picture shows um, a root and there are various ways that carbon enters the soil from that root. Um, a lot of it just gushes out the bottom um, and is sort of uh, 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 sticky stuff down here. Um, some is actually transferred out through mycorrhizal hyphae. Some comes into the soil from dead cells, et cetera. Um, but this is a, I think, awesome picture that is um, shows you really what it looks like down there at the root when bacteria are slurping up these exuded sugars. So the um, the bacteria have been stained to show blue. Okay, they're not really blue, right, <laughs> under the soil. They've been stained so they show blue under the microscope. And this clever set of scientists were, were able to take a picture of a bunch of bacteria glommed into this 
sugary exudate that's coming out the bottom of the root. Okay, so here it is. And these blue things are all bacteria that are glommed up on there, um, uh, taking this in. So because most of the carbon that winds up being stored actually goes through the microbes, any agricultural practices that boost microbial populations are going to increase carbon storage and the converse. Agricultural practices that reduce microbial populations are going to decrease carbon storage. So this is our, our first clue. Um, this uh, pair of graphs provides a little more evidence that having a healthy microbial community is, is good um, for both healthy soil and carbon. Um, this graph on the left shows the aggregate mass, that essentially uh, um, how much of the soil is in aggregates versus just laying around in little particles. Um, and so um, here we have more aggregates going up this way, a uh, higher density of mycorrhizal hyphae, more mycorrhizae, more aggregates. More mycorrhizae over here, more soil organic carbon, okay? So um, these microbes are out there helping us store carbon. Okay, how does carbon get stored in the soil? This is a, a, a great picture. It's been around a long time. It's from Ray Weil's book. Um, this is from the most recent edition in 2017, Weil and Brady. And um, it, it shows essentially a progression of you know, smaller and smaller and smaller pieces of a, um, a, an aggregate, a macro aggregate. And you can see here fungal hyphae and there's roots and stuff. You take this whole thing might be three millimeters, three millimeters something like that. Then you take a little piece of that, 0.3 millimeters and you see, okay, now the root looks really big and so does everything else. You go down a little smaller to the sub micro aggregate and then you start to see little pieces of silt and there's uh, bits of dead microbes on there like uh, uh, cell walls and other microbial debris. Um, and, and there are, uh, you can see little bits of, this is a little cartoon for, um, bits of clay and um, humus that are sort of all uh, mixed up with each other. Um, and you get down to the very smallest level, okay, this is uh, um, really small. And you start to see, here's one of those water retention pores, so here's some water. Um, at this level, uh, again, this is a cartoon, but it turns out that a lot of the stored carbon is adsorbed to means stuck on silt, pieces of silt, stuck into this clay, you know, humus domain, some of it is in there as, as, as partially, as, as highly um, degraded organic matter. And a lot of it is stuck to metal oxides, some stuck directly to clay. A lot of it is stuck to metal oxides and like iron oxide, et cetera. And so in these forms, when the carbon is stuck onto stuff, it's pretty well protected, okay? It stays on there. And the little bits that can be stored in, you know, the tiniest openings like, you know, like this are protected because some of these openings are too small for microbes to even get in there to be able to decompose the material. So the storage of carbon in soil is kind of a balance between how much of it is decomposed and that is eaten by the microbes and then released into the, into the atmosphere again as carbon dioxide. The balance between that, most of the organic material in the soil is eaten by microbes or other organisms. Um, a little bit of it is protected from the, that decomposition. And that's what makes the stored part of soil carbon. Okay, now you've seen the four soil health principles before, of course, these are the sacred soil health principles that drive soil health. Um, minimize disturbance, maximize soil cover. These are really helpful for microbes because these two principles protect the habitat. They keep the aggregates intact. They keep that 50-50 uh, balance between um, air and water and the rest of the stuff that's in soil. Maximize continuous living roots, maximize diversity. These two soil principles feed the microbes. So um, uh, 
even though sometimes the soil principles are, are presented as, you know, these are the things you need to do for a healthy soil, a large part of why these principles work is because they feed and protect the microbes and the other soil life, of course, too. Um, My apologies about the mouse. Magic, apple magic mice are very sensitive and you cannot touch them. So I wanna tell you just a little bit about two of the key um, uh, NRCS practices that are so beneficial to soil health. Um, No-till is super important to soil health because it maintains that soil aggregate structure. When you take you know, tillage equipment through a soil, um, and you get it down to a, a, a consistency like this for planting, um, that has busted up a lot of the soil aggregates. And um, when you do that, you don't have the stable uh, structure anymore. And also, when you break up the soil aggregates, a lot of the carbon that was stored in there and protected from the microbes is exposed to decomposition, and you lose a lot of carbon, soil carbon, when tillage occurs because the soil carbon is exposed to the microbes and they digest it and release that carbon as um, CO2. Um, we know in no-till that there's much better water infiltration and storage. We already talked about that. There's also less erosion, less compaction, and less fuel use, which is uh, important for both how much fuel costs and also for the carbon dioxide emissions. And when you come, this is again a picture from a, uh, one of the SARE books. Um, when you compare below ground what no-till soil looks like and what tilled soil looks like, there's really no comparison. I mean, this is just like habitat and there's roots and there's life in here and we've got root channels and there's worm burrows and all kinds of stuff going on. Here, we have this uniform um, material that has been sort of pulverized into this, uh, you know, small, small pieces as shown here. Then there's a hard plow pan underneath the, where the, the, the um, plowing um, equipment goes because it, it doesn't reach below this. And then down here, there's just, you know, other soil, but this is very, very hard. Um, this supports a lot more life than this. Okay, cover crops also super important for carbon storage. Um, uh, again, a couple of pictures from various books from SARE. Uh, there are a whole boatload of benefits of cover crops. Um, they, um, they add organic matter, they help the microbes. If you have a legume cover crop, they add nitrogen, suppress weeds and nematodes, reduce erosion. Okay, all kinds of good stuff. Um, repeated again over here. Um, when a farmer plants a cover crop, as in the mid-Atlantic, when a farmer plants a cover crop over the winter, instead of just leaving a no-till field sitting there, um, uh, it provides living roots that feed the microbes through the winter. When you have even a no-till field and it just sits there over the winter, there's no living roots. And so um, that uh, uh, sort of depresses the population of these helpful bacteria and the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, cover crops help increase aggregation, again, by providing more soil organic matter, which boosts the microbes, can inf increase infiltration, fight weeds. I mean, cover crops do all kinds of good things, as you know. Um, uh, uh, and planting uh, beans after a nice cover crop, um, this is a cartoon, of course, but the, the re reality of the science is that you get a much better set of roots because the soil is healthier and less compacted after you have a cover crop. Okay, now I want to talk about um, the sort of down and dirty of the scientific evidence that various NRCS practices help store carbon in the soil. And so I got involved in this uh, uh, in, in 2017 when I was um, on the Soil Health Consortium of the Department of Agriculture at, um, in Maryland. And I found myself uh, volunteered for <laughs> doing a literature review, a scientific literature review of um, how effective various practices were in actually sequestering carbon. 
And this did, you know, sometimes you volunteer for things, right? And you don't realize where they're going to take you. This has been both fascinating and has gone on for much longer than I thought it would. Um, but it has occupied a lot of my time for the last few years. Um, I went through a lot of information about um, carbon sequestration through some pivotal reports that have come out in the last decade, but I also reviewed the primary literature. And um, I uh, was able to uh, essentially come up with a list. This is not uh, just unique to me, but this is a list that are, is used um, pretty much among um, all the groups that are worried about carbon sequestration. Um, so we have this list of 24 recommended NRCS carbon sequestering practices. That is, they are recommended as being effective in sequestering carbon. Um, and I wrote this giant report again, which got a little bit larger than I thought it was going to be, um, called Increasing Soil Health and Sequestering Carbon in Agricultural Soils, um, a Natural Climate Solution, because stashing carbon in soil, as I said before, is one of the things we know how to do we know it works and we can do it right now and it is very low cost. So it has a lot of things going for it. Um, I, uh, uh, this report um, is being released as we speak and I just found out, in fact, it's not under embargo anymore. So I am providing a copy of the report to Stephanie for her to circulate um, to you if you're interested in it. It has a lot of information, not only about carbon sequestration, but also about um, soil health, how climate change is affecting agriculture, et cetera. So um, I, I hope that you'll take a look at it and um, you can feel free to email me with any questions you might have about it. Also in this report, I discuss in detail how we can um, measure and know how much um, impact these practices are having on greenhouse gas reduction through storing carbon in the soil and reducing the release of nitrous oxide from fertilizer. And um, it is very, very, very hard to measure small changes in, the so in soil carbon. And um, it, in fact, it's pretty much impossible for a farmer to go to a particular field and measure it after three years of doing no-till and, and, and seeing a change in carbon because there's so much carbon in the soil already. And the amount that's been added is very small in comparison to that. So the state of the art way to determine the impact of these practices on soil carbon sequestration is to use a, a really cool, um, computational tool called Comet Planner, which um, has been developed by NRCS, USDA, in conjunction with scientists at um, uh, Colorado State. And um, uh, the way this works is a little mysterious to a lot of people. And so I include in my report what I call the Comet Explainer, <laughs> which explains how Comet Planner works and how um, it, it obtains these estimates of carbon sequestration that I'm going to show you in just a minute. Um, in fact, right now. So um, in the report, I have a table of these 24 practices and um, it, the table is constructed like this. There are various classes of practices, cropland management, edge of field practices involving adding herbaceous plants, et cetera. And over here, we have how much greenhouse gas reduction we get per acre per year in metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, okay? Carbon dioxide equivalent allows us to also see the impacts of reducing the emissions of nitrous oxide, as I said before. So that's put on the same scale as carbon dioxide in terms of greenhouse gas impact. And um, we've got numbers here for various states, but let's just focus on the numbers for Maryland. Um, you can see that the cropland management practices and adding herbaceous plants to the edge of fields um, gives you about mm, between uh, um, a fifth and, um, and a half of a metric ton of carbon dioxide um, reduction per year, per acre, okay? So let's look at going from intensive tillage to no-till. You get about half a metric ton per acre per year of greenhouse gas reduction. 
So what does that mean, right? Who knows what a metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent actually is? Well, here's how we can interpret it. The average car emits 4.6 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year, okay? So it doesn't take too many acres of no-till to cancel out the emissions of one car, okay? And so the, the, the larger these numbers, the bigger uh, bang we are getting from using these practices. Um, there are some interesting, um, again, this mouse is driving me crazy, I apologize. Um, there are some interesting differences between the states. I'm not gonna go into that in any detail. Um, I just have averages for five states. Um, but you know that might turn out to be interesting in the future. These numbers, by the way, were obtained um, from Comet Planner and analyzed by Dr. Jennifer Moore, who used to be at the Amer American Farmland Trust, but who is now um, at USDA ARS, using a tool she developed called CARPE, carbon, um, um, oh boy, I'm gonna forget what that means now, carbon reduction prediction tool or something. I'm sorry, I forget exactly what it means. Um, so we're getting um, about half a metric ton per acre per year, a little bit more for legume cover crops, a little bit less for non-legume cover crops. Um, uh, nutrient management giving us a little bit. Adding um, uh, perennial grasses forage or, or crops grown for biomass and harvested, again, gives us about half. Um, and um, around the edges of field, implementing practices like um, contour buffer strips, filter strips, field borders, grass waterways, all of these, okay, um, are giving us about 0.4 of a metric ton. So this is not a lot per acre, but there are many, many acres on which these practices can be used. And that means it'll amount to a lot of carbon um, sequestration and greenhouse gas reduction. How about other practices on the list? Adding woody plants, tree and shrub establishment, riparian forest buffers, etc., hedgerows. Woody plants are really good at sequestering carbon because what is wood except a lot of carbon? So per acre per year, you get a lot more out of woody plants than you do out of um, cover crops or no-till. But there are far fewer acres in agriculture on which these practices are used. Um, grazing, co uh, Comet Planner um, doesn't really at the moment take into account all of the you know, variety of practices that people use for rotational grazing. They model this as um, basically just removing less forage from the um, from an area than intensive grazing and you don't get very much carbon reduction, greenhouse gas reduction from that. But what is really beneficial is managing rangeland and pastures by seeding adapted perennial or self-sustaining forages, that is annual forages that drop their seeds and then grow back to improve grassland. Again, you can get half a metric ton per acre per year from that, which is you know appreciable because there's a lot of um, uh, grassland, pasture and grassland in the US. Okay, so, um, uh, where woody plants can be used, of course, they should only be planted where woody plants were naturally found, and native species should be used whenever possible, but you can get a really big um, impact from planting woody plants. Okay, now Jennifer Moore has done a lot of work asking this question. How much greenhouse gas reduction could we get if we really just went crazy on these NRCS practices and everybody used no-till and cover crops, okay? So that's kind of the best possible situation. Um, and so I just show you graphics for three states, Maryland, Illinois, and Colorado. Um, Maryland's a pretty small state, so the most we can expect to get, this is millions of metric tons per car of carbon dioxide, um, is half a million metric ton if we maxed out cover crops and conservation tillage. Um, in fact, we do an awful lot of this in Maryland already for water quality. And we have you know, already attained 79% of the maximum. So Maryland, as most of you probably know, leads the nation in the use of um, cover crops and no-till. Illinois, okay, um, they could really get a lot of greenhouse gas reduction if they utilize these, just these two practices to their fullest. 
Right now, they're only getting 40% of the maximum. Most of it is from the use of conservation tillage. Um, um, I'm sorry, most of it is from the use of um, cover crops and conservation tillage. So I'm getting mixed up here. Let me back up. Red is remaining. Blue is what we're doing already. So they're not doing cover crops in Illinois, but they are doing a little bit of conservation tillage. Colorado, again, they can't get nearly as much. In total as Illinois, they're at 53% of their max already because there's quite a bit of conservation tillage out there. Almost no cover crop use, okay? Um, and we'll see a little bit more the amount of cover crop and no-till used across the nation in just a second. So what do these numbers mean? Again, let's put this in terms uh, that we can relate to as regular people. Um, if Maryland was able to reach 100% of its maximum um, greenhouse gas reduction through cover crops and conservation tillage, it would be like growing 17.3 million trees for 10 years or removing 226,000 cars per year. Okay, now all of us who drive in Maryland would really like this. So <laughs> of course it's not removing the actual cars, it's just canceling out their emissions. In Illinois, it would be like growing 483 million trees for 10 years. In Colorado, 55 million trees for 10 years, okay? Um, or in Illinois, removing 6.3 million cars per year, okay? So um, Illinois would be a great place to get more of these practices used because we would get a very big impact in terms of greenhouse gas reduction from um, increased adoption of these um, key strategies. Now, uh, a few years ago, um, I used uh, the previous incarnation of Comet Planner um, um, estimates to calculate how much agriculture um, has already contributed to Maryland's greenhouse gas reduction goals. As I said, most of the no-till cover crops and other um, carbon sequestering practices used in Maryland have been used to reduce nutrient flows to Chesapeake Bay or inc increase water quality in some other way. Um, and so I got the number of acres in each of as many of the um, 24 practices as I could, which wound up being only less than half of them. Um, I got the number of acres that were in each of these practices and I used Comet Planner values to determine how much greenhouse gas reduction we got from each practice with only the practices used in Maryland for water quality from 2007 to 2017. Um, we reduced atmospheric carbon dioxide by 6.1 million metric tons. Okay, again, sorry, in the units, 6.1 million metric tons. This is like removing 150,000 cars from the road in Maryland every year, or 1.5 million cars for the entire period. Nobody even knew that this was happening. So we call this stealth carbon sequestration when, <laughs> in fact, it's occurring in the background, but nobody was aware of it. And in fact, it sort of surprised the people at Maryland Department of the Environment who keep track of um, greenhouse gas emissions because all of a sudden there was this absorption of greenhouse gases that were not being included in their um, in their tallies. So I'm um, um, on the verge of updating this using uh, more recent comet numbers. Okay, um, how much scope is there for enrolling more acres in these practices? Let's just talk about no-till and cover crops. Um, here are three maps showing. Um, how much of the agriculture in each state is done with intensive tillage, with reduced tillage, or with no-till, okay? And what we can see is, oh, we cut off Florida here, sorry. Um, there are a few states that are use, still using a lot of intensive tillage, okay? Um, California, some of these Western states, Texas, uh, Florida, Maine, somewhat inexplicably, okay? The um, uh, uh, quite a few of the Midwest states are turning strongly to no-till now. Um, Maryland is still the, uh, the no-till capital of the country. Um, so uh, there's very little intensive tillage being done in, no, in, in, um, in Maryland. Um, reduced till this is the converse of this. These numbers all add up to 100, right? So 51% um, of agriculture in Minnesota is done with intensive tillage. Most of the rest of it is done with reduced tillage, a little bit with no-till, okay? So you can do this for every state. Uh, there's a little bit of reduced till in California, 
very little no-till, very little no-till in, in most of these states. So there's a lot of scope for improvement, for reducing tillage. And that, you know, here are the states that were impacted by that gigantic flood. Um, even though a lot of them are using some reduced tillage, they still had prolonged flooding in fields because the soil was not soaking the water up. How about cover crops? When we look across the country at all crop acres, that is, you know, not just the commodity crops as shown here, um, we see that cover crops are really not being used very much. Hardly anybody in the Midwest is using cover crops. In fact, a lot of farmers in the Midwest don't even do crop rotation. So there's a tremendous amount of scope for improvement in the use of cover crops nationwide. Again, here's Maryland um, and the Mid-Atlantic uh, where cover crops are much more common, but still there are a lot of fields in Maryland that don't have cover crops in the winter. Commodity acres are a little bit better. Okay, so the, um, here we can see is about 30% of all crop acres and a higher percentage in Maryland for commodity acres, that's like row crops. Um, uh, cover crops are not that often used in vegetables. Um, uh, um, uh, and that's you know, true across the country. Um, and no-till is not used in vegetables very much either. But those, are, uh, those practices are being now, um, a lot of work is going into adapting those for vegetable production. Okay, what would it take to increase the use of these practices in the states where they're not being used very much? Well, we could provide incentives from the state or from the federal government. It would be very useful to farmers to make some of the key equipment more widely available. It would be easier to plant cover crops if farmers could use things like interseeders to plant the cover crop seed into standing corn or soybeans instead of waiting till the end of harvest. It would, it would reduce herbicide use um, and, uh, and use of tillage for weed control if in fact cover crops were um, terminated with, by smashing them down with a roller crimper. So, but these are things that are not widely available. If they were more widely available, we might get more use of no-till and cover crops. How about providing more information about the benefits of these practices, not just for soil health, but for profits, which of course is the bottom line for um, many farmers. Um, there are definite economic benefits to farmers of soil health. Um, increased soil health allows farmers to use less of the costly inputs, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, herbicides, pesticides, fuel, irrigation, all of that stuff costs a lot of money. If you have soil health, then those, you know, that protection that those things provide is being provided from the soil. It can take a lot of time or, or some time, not a lot of time, a lot of time implies, you know, decades. It can take several years to reap the full benefits of healthy soil after converting from some of these standard um, agricultural practices. But savings in these inputs can boost profits even when farmers get a little reduction in yield over the short term. Most farmers measure their success through yield. In fact, they can be making a bigger profit even if yield declines a little bit. And there's a lot, a lot of evidence for that. Healthy soil reduces weather risk and stabilizes yields. This also is good for profits. And as I said, people want um, soil to be stashed, carbon to be stashed in the soil. So there are new federal incentives, we hope coming down the pike. Maryland already um, provides incentives for these practices. NRCS provides incentives. Um, carbon trading will, will put even more money on the table. So there, it's economically very beneficial to do these practices. Um, I did a little- Excuse me, Sarah. Excuse yeah. me, Sarah. I'm just gonna jump in with a, a time check here. We've got about five minutes left I'm for just you. about done. Okay, yeah, just very done. good, thanks. Um, I did a little computation using some numbers from an NRCS study that came out a few years ago. Um, they figured that every tillage pass over a 50 acre field costs about $425. Um, in Maryland, so I used, I used the numbers in that study to do the following. In Maryland in 2013, we know that 965,000 acres um, were planted in no-till row crops, okay? So how much did farm, Maryland farmers save by using no-till? If it takes three passes to till for planting, and I think it actually takes more than that, Maryland farmers saved a total of $1,000. 
12.2 million gallons of fuel by not you know, running their tractors over to do this planting, 12.2 million gallons of fuel and about $25 million just in 2013 by using no-till. So this, you know, is not chump change, $25 million, okay? Of course, there's a lot of farmers in Maryland, but still, um, tillage costs a lot of money because it uses a lot of fuel. When you don't till, you don't have to use the fuel. You don't have to maintain the, the equipment as much. You don't have the labor expenses. That's all factored into this. Um, so no-till really saves money. It saves time too. One of the privileges I had during working on the soil report with people from the National Wildlife Federation is that they have a guy there, Dr. Adam Reamer, who's a social scientist. And he helped me understand that providing information in outreach is not enough to get farmers to adopt new management practices. There are a number of social and psychological factors that go into how farmers decide to change their management practices from say tillage to no-till, okay? It's not just, this is gonna save you money. There's a lot of other stuff that goes into it. So um, I dove into the social science literature, which between you and me is filled with jargon. <laughs> and I modified one of Adam's uh, uh, graphs in one of his papers um, uh, to be this, and I'm not gonna go through this in detail, it's in the report, but, um, the uh, farmers sort of form their perceptions of a new practice like no-till using both information that they get, you know, during an outreach session, how to use the practice, evidence for costs and benefits, et cetera, and various contextual factors that uh, pertain to them on their farm, their own characteristics, their risk aversion or not, the characteristics of their farm, the farming context. These two things go in there together and they're sort of mauled around in people's minds and then that um, winds up um, determining whether or not they adopt or reject a new practice. However, these contextual factors, the social psychological issues are rarely considered in soil health outreach. So I think we could really um, improve that, identify what farmers see as the benefits and barriers to adopting these strategies, increase the benefits, reduce the barriers, pretty obvious use peer group teaching, et cetera, on-farm demonstrations. All of these would um, hopefully increase the success of outreach efforts. Okay, um, there are a number of environmental and health benefits to society. We already know this, increased habit of, of using these practices, increased habitat, better water quality, less erosion and dust, less nitrate in the water, it may, means better drinking water, um, and better ecosystem services, which, if people were willing to pay for that, it's worth up to $3,500 an acre. Um, so I just want to end now by saying the practices that improve soil health, um, increase agri agricultural resilience to climate change, and they make agriculture part of the climate solution. So incentivizing these with society, you know, with public funds, I think is very worthwhile because that shares the cost of implementing these strategies. And um, uh, putting more of these carbon sequestering practices on the ground would be beneficial in so many ways. So incentivizing these practices is a triple win. It's a win for the environment, it's a win for farmers, and it's a win for all of society because it will help us control the rate of climate change.